So what I've done actually with no apology actually for this time is that th this is a massive topic um, and I have an agenda um, which is all about management which I've probably bored highly with before um, uh, and the lack of training I think it exists but anyway that, that I shall talk more about that later. Um, what I've done is, is, is a very long hours talk but I'm going to condense it down because I wasn't sure, sure, too sure who's going who to arrive, who's going to be here so what I'm going to do is skip over a bit so I don't apologise because I'm going to focus on what I think will be helpful to the group and what I've just listened to. But Neurodiversity is huge and um, it always attracts um, in the HR world quite a big audience. I did one for CIPD, um, we had over 100. Um, I did one recently for um, another HR network group, we had about 125 on there because I think it's one of those topics that sadly or perhaps rightly depending on your view can get a little bit lost in the myriad of other things that HR tends to focus on and the media focuses on and that's not to downplay anything else which is important in the HR world um, but it does encompass lots of things including mental health um, and lots of other issues that can arise but my focus really today um, and the reason I do these talks is because it's education but as much as um, I relish the opportunity to deal with litigation and the employment tribunal for you or for any client. It's far nicer if we can avoid it in the first place. And I think neurodiversity um, is a bubbling issue. Um, it's a little bit of an issue that I think it's going to get far worse for employers if they don't catch on to how important this really is. And not just for employers, but I think for many of us as well in the business world to, to really try and understand the other person more and where they're coming from and how they think differently. So hopefully today, um, I'll give you my perspective um, on how things are out there. And I think how a lack of education, um, which is no fault of any employer or manager, but one thing I want to thread through today is that management training and how important I really think that is, whether you're a one man band, whether you are um, in charge of lots, lots of staff, I think educating yourself and making sure your managers are trained well enough to have conversations and to understand the other person is so vital. And I'll explain more about that later. So is this working? Yes, it is. Okay, so that's me. I'm a solicitor. I'm also a solicitor advocate, which means I can appear in the Employment Appeal Tribunal and the Appeal Courts. Um, and uh, my advocacy is one of my um, passions, as is talking. I like the sound of my own voice, as you will discover. Um, but I, I like engaging and talking about HR and employment law. Um, absolutely love it. Could do it all day. And this is one element of it that I really enjoy as well. Um, I'm on a mission, mission on management, which, which is, I think, it hardly would agree, hopefully, if she nods, I won't look at it. But I think the clients we see, and make, like many HR consultants, solicitors, we see a whole different myriad of different um, clients, employers from big, small. And I think one of the issues we find sometimes is that managers are promoted on performance, which means you're great at your job, go and be a manager. And so they do, and then they fail epically. And I think that's one of the things nationally as a nation, I think we're pretty poor at. And I, I will be disagreed, but that's fine. But I think evidentially, I'll be able to show you some serious examples of why I think that's right. And so one of the things I always try to do with clients um, is tell them what I think. And sometimes that's saying, I think your new managers need training. What's happened here is there's a complete mismatch. There's a conflict because your manager didn't know to have, didn't know to have this conversation. And that person interpreted the conversation completely differently. And I've got plenty of cases I could give you an examples. I can't, so confidentiality, where one conversation with a manager has ended up, ended up in a tribunal case. It happens. So it's serious and it causes damage. OK, so there are my psychology and psychiatry, uh, psychiatry qualifications. They're all listed there for you to see, because um, clearly I'm an expert in psychology and psychiatry, um, which is utter nonsense isn't it we all know that um, but the point there of course is that I don't come from a position of expertise I don't think there's anything I don't think as an expert in employment law or HR um, uh, David Reed QC once said that at a conference I completely agree with him and the reason is because we're dealing with human beings all the time and human beings change you can you can give law and policy to a human being and they will react in a different way um, every single one of them when we're dealing with neurodiversity we're dealing with the brain and the way people think which means it is an expert area very expert area you need to be very careful on you can make some judgment calls, of course, but you'll see um, throughout this talk, I'm going to be referring to occupational health and talking about occupational health and how important it is to get advice and help when you need it. OK, so what we're going to cover, what's neurodiversity? Why is it important? How does that mix in with the Equality Act? What are the risks? Recruitment comes into this. Um, key cases and best practice. What I've done also, and I hope I can try and cover, depending on how we go, is stress at work and some mental health issues as well, because it's a big topic, quite rightly so. But what tends to happen with neurodiversity is when there's an issue or a conflict, there will be other issues going on like mental health or stress at the same time. So I think it's just to be able to cover off and leave with you some hints, some tips that you can use in your own life, with your family's life, and hopefully with those you employ or manage um, as well. Okay, so 
hopefully you'll recognize some of these people. Um, no prizes for what the connection with all these people might be, considering the topic we're talking about. Um, and for those who've guessed it, yes, they've always got, they, all of them have, um, as far as we know, the two oldest ones, uh, neurodivergent um, diagnosis. So Alan Turing there at the top left, fantastic mathematician. Um, and we, the thought is that he may have been dyslexic um, or autistic, mainly because of, I think Derek's entering the waiting room, if that means anything too high. Um, I think the reason being is because the evidence seems to suggest that we know about him, that he was called antisocial, um, but he was obviously extremely intelligent. And, and we'll see how antisocial behaviour and conflict can often come into um, the workplace when someone's dealing with a, a high pressure job as well. Um, Albert Einstein. Um, they think was dyslexic. Um, he had problems with spelling and grammar, but he excelled in mathematics and science instead. He had delayed speech, apparently, and not, didn't speak comfortably until the age of six. Now, the point about Alan and Albert is that back then, when they were in school, there was no test they could do. It really wasn't known about. And, and that's why, thankfully, we've moved on so far. But also, I think, why my theory about why this is a, a problem brewing away in the next 10 years is going to be, um, you might agree with. Richard Branson, um, the epic legend, um, he is dyslexic and he also has ADHD, um, which we'll come and talk about in a minute. And he dropped out of school when he was 15 probably due to some um, issues with his academics that perhaps wasn't spotted back then. It probably wasn't dealt with appropriately. Um, but he says um, dyslexia is a brilliant way of thinking and that people with dyslexia are likely to have the skills of the future due to their vivid imaginations. And Bill Gates has dyslexia as well. So four legendary people, I apologize, they're all male. That's probably my unconscious bias coming out there. That, that's not intentional. It was just, I was trying to bring some really, really well-known people. There are some other celebrities, pop stars, who I have to say, I didn't know the name. Well, I knew the name, but I didn't know who they were. So I don't want to embarrass myself with talking about. So, but they're, they're worth Googling because there are some um, famous people who do have this. I want to share with you some of the things that have been said to me about neurodiversity. And these have honestly been said. Um, this first one was said to me by an individual. I won't name or identify them. They are professional and they're in charge of around over, well, probably about over hundred staff. I thought dyslexia was something that thick people said when they wanted more time in exams. Um, the same person said, I wish that dyslexia was around when I was at school. Um, and one thing that I think we all hear quite often is they're so on the spectrum. Um, now, the first one took me back. I didn't quite know what to say. I had to say I, I was silent, which is, which is rare for me, but I didn't know quite what to say. Um, and um, I'm not on Pinterest, but I love the little quote on the right there where you think this really encapsulates some of the ignorance out there, isn't it? Which is, when did ignorance become a point of view? Um, if you're not educated in it and you don't understand it, shut up and don't give your opinion because you will harm somebody. Um, and that's serious because you could lose good people. Um, potentially good friends, but certainly in a business in a business side of things, you could lose good people because you're not prepared and you're showing your ignorance. So that was said, has actually been said to me in response to me talking about neurodiversity. Concerning. Okay. I'm afraid it's a bit, a bit death by PowerPoint because I just really want to highlight to you some of the problems we have with neurodiversity. Because people often say to me, Robin, it's really interesting. What's neurodiversity? And I say, well, um, some people call it neurodivergence, others neurodiversity. So the Autistic um, Interstate UK, fantastic organisation, calls it this. It's a broad term used to divide the, describe the many and varying ways which human brains are wired. And that's a fantastic way of talking about it. It's how we're wired. Everyone's different. So autism, ADHD, ADD, dyslexia, dyspraxia, dysphasic, dysmorphic, dyscanculate, all those things we'll talk about in a sec. ACAS, our friends at ACAS, for some reason, have archived their neurodiversity guidance highly sure what that says about the agenda but anyway it's gone you can find out the national archives though and it says this most sorts of neurodivergence are experienced on a spectrum each form of neurodivergence such as dyslexia or autism has a range of associated characteristics they can vary from individual to individual so that's when people say he's so he or she is showing the spectrum what they're really saying is probably right um, but be warned those three comments you heard about can very easily amount to harassment under the Equality Act, no doubt in the world. Banter, comments, there's a claim straight away. So one interaction, one comment, stupidly made, ignorantly made, even if innocently, doesn't matter, there is a claim there. To give you an idea, we think, and this was ACAS guidance, which I think it probably is right when I looked at the stats and the data, is that one in seven of us um, probably are neurodivergent or neurodiverse. So we think differently and we're wired differently. So 15%, so that's quite high. 
But I just want you to take a step back for a moment and think about maybe some of the large organizations you've worked in or been employed by, and then just start to think about how many people came up to you and told you they were autistic or had ADHD, probably tiny, tiny minority, if none. Um, in my time in charge of 120 people, leading them, there was probably one who came forward. However, what's interesting is I reckon there were probably about 10 I knew straight away they were, um, for the various reasons we'll come on to. What I'm going to do is run through probably the top ones, if there's a better way of putting it, the ones that I come across more than often, um, and certainly the ones I'm going to say cause a problem, but I mean that in terms of a conflict situation in the workplace. I don't mean that as they're a problem, but it wants to be alert to. And some of you may be, and one thing I'm also very alive to, and I should have said this, is that when I do these courses, people often say to me, my son's autistic, my daughter's autistic, whatever it be. And that is brilliant, because actually that gives such a spin. And I've got a very close family member who's autistic, very late diagnosis. Um, and so I also have a connection with that. So I sympathise with that. So everything I'm saying today is general. I'm not saying this is what this person is or what they are, it, it, it varies. So autistic people may, so this is, they may find it hard to communicate and interact with other people. They may find it hard to understand how other people think or feel, so empathy. Find things like bright lights or loud noises overwhelming, stressful or uncomfortable, get anxious or upset, unfamiliar, take longer to understand information or do things over and over and over again. Okay, that's from the NHS. Dyslexia, very common. I think it's very common. Read and write, write very slowly. Confuse the order of letters and words. Be confused by letters that are the same. BD is a classic. Pouring inconsistent spelling. Difficulty of information that's written. Hard to carry out. Sequence of directions. And struggle with planning and organisation. So I'm whizzing through this so you can find your own research on it. I'm giving you a, 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 the top, if you like. Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, ADHD. I think you've all probably heard of that, and that's been thrown around. Um, so this can... I've seen this arise in different situations in the workplace, but typically it will come around about things like coping with stress, being restless, completely wired all the time, very energetic, but also struggles with organisation and time management. Okay, And they may have problems with social relationships and, and interaction as well. Now, dyspraxia. Um, I've been a barrister once with dyspraxia. I didn't know he had dyspraxia until the client pointed out his tie was round here and his his um, collar was up here. And it was we were about to go into Winchester uh, County Court for a three-day trial. And he turned around and said, I'm so sorry, I'm dyspraxic. And that's the first time about eight years ago I ever heard of what, what dyspraxia was. So it, 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 I saw it in that it was um, difficulty in dressing. I mean, he was completely eccentric, an extremely intelligent man, but he would literally turn up to court with everything all over the place. Had no idea it was like it. He'd obviously looked in the mirror, but hadn't noticed it. So his brain was just wired to look at different things in a different way. And there you go. It was a lovely client who dressed him in the end and called him round. But of course, he apologised and said, I've got dyspraxia. Good on him. Good on him. He didn't try to cover it up. He didn't need to apologise. He made it clear what the issue was. Now, what I want to... What's interesting for me when I give this talk, um, especially to, to, to HR um, professionals, is now put all of those symptoms in the work context. Put them in a team of 10, any of those, or put them in a, a high performing, perhaps a sales environment or high performing environment. It's no surprise, is it, that these individuals could come across issues of conflict, poor performance, capability, absence, related issues such as depression, anxiety. Um, PTSD, they are common and we know how common they can be, but it's surprising sometimes how these undiagnosed issues can also be related. So it's no wonder I think this is becoming a bubbling issue. And the reason for that, and the spoiler alert, is, is I think if you look at how education is working now, so the millennials or the 2000 onwards, um, it was becoming very much to be an issue within schools. So a lot of the SEN was becoming far more clued up and aware of these neurodiversity issues. Fast forward 10 years, um, a family member of, of mine does work in this area. It is big. There's a massive push for diagnosis. So I think in about five, 10 years time, as these children start to come through and start to be employees, they're coming through with diagnoses already. They're not having to wait 20 or 30 years like we may have to, they're coming through with a diagnosis and employees need to be ready. Because if they're not ready, there's going to be problems. And these people, unfortunately, uh, may become unemployed or may have to leave um, or may just feel not wanted. This is distinct legal concept concepts here. So. The HR people in the room will know what a disability is. To those who are not or who think they do, this is not blue badge disability. This is employment law disability. This is all about um, the Equality Act. And, and, and there is a, a four-stage test. Essentially, 
a physical or mental impairment, a physical or mental issue diagnosis. Well, clearly a neurodivergent issue uh, diagnosis is going to qualify going to tick that box straight away. However, it doesn't end there because that's got to have an adverse effect on the ability to carry out day-to-day -day activities. So it can't just be, I'm on a spectrum, but very, very low, but my life is fine. I don't have to adjust to anything. It doesn't have any impact. There's got to be an impact and that effect and impact's got to be substantial. And that's a difficulty the informed tribunals are finding at the moment because we are finding neurodiversity cases coming through. Um, there, I'll share with you um, two or three autism cases where the senior courts have had to interpret what autism is and whether it's a disability and you tend to find once that happens once a senior court says yes this is disability it can be claimed you tend to find then people are more confident coming through and claimant lawyers in particular are more confident in making those claims which is another reason why it's important to be ready and finally the effect that is substantial has got to be long term and employment law purposes that means for at least 12 months um, or for the life so you don't recover from autism or dyslexia you've got it um, and you don't have to prove that you have it forever you've got it you can manage it you can mask it and we'll come to that later okay so discrimination occurs uh, in two ways effectively direct and direct isn't very common because it's rare that employers will say i'm not employing you because you've got dyslexia or because you're in a wheelchair or because you're blind. Normally, it's because they're doing something which is going to impact upon disabled people more than those who are not disabled. And we call that indirect discrimination. And that's the more common one. Harassment occurs very easily and it's probably underclaimed, actually, um, in, in my opinion, because there's a lot of the banter claims coming through. We've had the baldness recently, the baldness case um, that was um, considered harassment. But I think harassment on things like you're so on the spectrum, he show so on the spectrum, those sort of things I think we should start being careful about and start talking to our clients, our colleagues, our managers, just monitoring what's going on. Uh, and, and just listening because banter cases can amount to harassment cases very very easily and a one-off incident can not always but it can be uh, a harassment claim reasonable adjustments we will talk about it, it's difficult to extend with um, neurodiversity because of the expert guidance you really need occupational health some are better than others i've seen some appalling ones who simply have googled it and you find others who are fantastic at it and they make it psychiatric advice as well um, but reasonable adjustments are effectively making the individual come back to work sooner if they're off and if they are at work making sure that any disadvantage that's been in front of them if it's substantial can actually be reduced so they can do their work better stay at work and be equal and that's what a reasonable adjustment is victimization we won't cover too much but essentially where somebody has done something as in complains that they're being treated differently and they may then be treated badly what we call a detriment that could be dismissed it could be bullied because they've come out and spoken and said i've got dyslexia i've got autism and you're not treating me correctly or I think you need to make reasonable adjustments you're not. If the employer does something even inadvertently bad because of that, um, then that can amount to victimization. I'm gonna to come to health questions a bit later, but just to highlight to you, so these, all of these claims arise from the job advert, advert stage. From the moment you put the job advert on Deed, typically as we all do these days, the claims can arise. So those of you who are recruiting, um, my job is to scare you, um, but at the same time, a bit later to give you some practical advice, because you should be scared. I think it's important. Employing people is a privilege, but also it's a very risky business. And the only way to never be have a claim in the employment tribunal is to employ nobody. That's the only guarantee. Um, but thankfully, we do, and we can give you practical advice to help. Um, health questions. This is something that I think all HR, um, and I love throwing this out there because I stir the pot because um, everyone disagrees with me. Uh, well, everybody, uh, everyone's different views. I am in favour of health questions, um, not before the job offer, but upon job offer, you then give a health questionnaire. I think it's actually vital. Um, however, um, absolutely respect other people's opinions and they often don't do it. Heidi potentially might be one who doesn't agree. Um, I have my reasons as to why, but I won't share them with you now. Um, but health questions can help. You can, the, 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 the thing to always remember is, it is none of your business, the state of health of the individual when they apply for your job. It shouldn't make any difference whatsoever. There are some exceptions to that, but for the moment we won't bore you with those. But that's the point. When you make the job offer, potentially you can ask what we call relevant questions. Not, can you tell us everything about the last 10 years of your life, but it may well be this certain aspects of the job that need to be known. For example, um, for associate solicitors or above, it's quite common that occupational health will be 
um, made available and report to a law firm, especially in the London area, it's incredibly pressured because they want to know about this individual. Who are they? What are they coming from? Can they handle the stress? I mean, handle in a, in a nice medical way as opposed to are they tough? Um, but you may have a fitness issue, um, bending, lifting, handling. So it is a serious issue. Um, if you speak to me, I'll probably give you a different answer than somebody else would. But that's great because that's HR and that's why we do it. It doesn't necessarily mean I'm right or someone else is wrong, um, but I'm always right. So, um, so remember it's from the job ad onwards. Um, please do remember that. Um, and you and your company will be named. We're gonna, I'm gonna show you a couple of cases later. One of the things I always, and, and I use the word scare, I don't, I don't mean to, but um, I, I make it clear to managers and employers in particular that you will be named. If an employment tribunal case is made against the employer or you personally, you will be named. And we'll see um, a lady later on, I think her name's Diane, she's been named. And this case, unfortunately, is banded about one employment lawyers for training because it's great. But this poor manager has been named, I wouldn't say shamed, but she's been named. So it is, it should concern you that if you get this wrong, if you discriminate or if you unfairly dismiss somebody, it's very likely you're going to be named in a tribunal decision because they are written and they're then published on the Employment Tribunal website, which you may not care about too much. If you win or you successfully defend it, you may say, well, that's happy days. I've shown I can defend it. I didn't do anything wrong. However, um, that's not something to bank your, to, to really bank on, and I think there's always a risk people will form their own view. And you won't get in employment tribunal judgments the context. Um, judges haven't got time because I know them to sit down and tell you everything about it. They'll tell you the facts as they know them, and we'll talk about that later. So do be aware, and HR advisors in particular, um, you can't hide. You will be brought forward as a witness. If I was in an employment tribunal case, I would call HR and I'd want to cross-examine them because you are helping the decision makers and I want to know what was in your mind and I want to know what was in the decision makers mind and the only way I can know that is by cross-examining in the witness box. So be wary, be scared, but be sensible and practical. Okay, OH is key. We call OH, occupational health is absolutely key. If you don't have an OH contact now um, and you need one, please contact one of us in the room, you know, hiding our uh, absolute prayers of help. The time to say I need occupational health is not when you need occupational health because there are some awful, terrible, ridiculously nonsense occupational health providers out there um, who are useless, frankly useless. I can't name them because it's a bit defamatory, but absolutely useless. There are others who are good. Um, I know good ones, hiding those good ones, and I won't be swayed. I will use these people until the time they get it wrong and I won't use them again. But get it ready now before you need it. And it may well be you're a trustee on a board, it may be you're a score governor. Ask now, do we have an occupational health provider? Who do we use? What are we going to do if? Because the time to worry about it is not when you need it, not to do that. Um, your obligation um, as an employer, as, as a manager, in particular, if you're, if, if you're leading somebody responsible to someone, is to understand what the true medical position is. What is the medical position with this individual in front of me? They're telling me they've got depression. They're telling me they've got autism. They're telling me they've got cancer, whatever it is. But you're not an expert. Going back to my psychiatric qualifications, we're not. You're good managers, you're good leaders, you're good finance people, whatever you may be, but you're not doctors, you're not nurses, you're not medical. So you need assistance. And when you get an occupational health report, you could deal with it on your own. I wouldn't. I'd much prefer to make sure someone sees that with me. Okay. Get occupational health now. Make sure you know who you're going to go to. Get yourself a good employment lawyer now. Get yourself a good HR contact now because the time is not to ring around your contacts and friends asking who they recommend. Get one now. I have a video to share, which I'm going to say to the last, but and there's a reason for that. But I just want you to think about something for a moment. I want you to. Think about something that makes you really, really scared. I want you to jot it down. So for me, it's snakes. Hate snakes. Always have. Cannot stand them. Don't want anything to do with them. I don't know why they're here. I hate snakes. I've written that down. But I want you to jot down now what you're scared of. What makes you anxious, makes your heart go faster? Um, and what worries you? What makes you sweat? What is your palpitations? So I want you to hold that thought for a moment. And then we're going to come back to this video I'm going to show you that was done by the BBC. I'm going to save it to the end, so I'm going to try and whiz through this, if that's okay. Um, I'm assuming there's no questions, Heidi, or no one disagreeing with me, which I've spoken to title two, so I'm just going to carry on. Um, okay. I want to tell you about when it goes wrong. Um, so it's fantastic. If you ever want to be reassured as an employer or a manager, just go on the employment tribunal website um, and just type in unfair dismissal, and you'll get a myriad of government organisations and local authorities, because there's no one here from the local authority that think they get it wrong. 
Um, and with all the money they've got, HR resources, NHS in particular gets it wrong quite a lot. I don't know why, probably because of the amount of people they employ. But if you ever want reassurance that you're not that bad, have a read of a few of the cases. I want to tell you about Mr. Elliot. Now, this is a, a, a leading case now because this went to the Employment Appeal Tribunal, which means that employment tribunals have to follow this case. This is interesting for me for two reasons. One is it talks about disability, but actually this dealt with autism. So Mr. Elliot, it's quite a sad case, Mr. Elliot was employed by Dorset County Council for over 30 years. He was something to do with geography. I don't quite understand it, I don't pretend to, it went well beyond me, but he was something very technical and intellectual. He'd been there for over 30 years, the same. During that time, I think they had the same manager, but the manager basically said, you've got to record your time. And he said, fine. But the manager said, look, I don't care when you work, just record nine to five all the time. And so he did. But typically, Mr. Elliot would do other things. He might go into something else during the day and he would work at night, sometimes till midnight. And his wife had whinged at his work so much. He was extremely dedicated, extremely focused and incredibly intense in his work. So flag autism, going back to one of, the, some of those traits we're looking at, very intense. He was also very, very rules based and instructions based. So just bear that in mind. At that time, when there was a problem with Dorset County Council, he didn't know he had autism, but he was told, just record nine to five all the time, it's not a problem. New manager comes in and says, you're not recording your time properly, I think you're lying, and I think you need to have misconduct proceedings against you because you're not recording your time and it's dishonest. Um, fast forward to the Employment Tribunal and an autism diagnosis. He did have autism, he was disabled, and he was unfairly dismissed. And it's been sent back to the employment tribunal to decide properly what happens from here. But where it went wrong, if you look at this, and, and if you look at the, the, if you like, the post mortem that I like to do in these cases, um, it's a huge case, well worth reading if you're interested in it. But effectively, what was happening here is you had a, an autistic man who was doing what he'd been told to do all the time, did his job very, very well. His traits, according to the doctor involved, was unflinching honesty. He struggled to process and understand people's emotions. He couldn't understand verbal and nonverbal communication. He dealt with black and white thinking and he took people literally. I suspect, and I could be wrong, I don't know, it might be unfair, but I suspect the manager who came on to replace his old manager didn't know him, probably had no neurodiversity training. So dealing with this individual, he quite understandably probably saw this man who was miscalculating and misrecording his hours. Ended in the Informed Tribunal case, lots of money spent by the County Council, lots of money spent by Mr. Elliot, and he's likely to win. It's probably settled because I haven't seen it come through since. So that gives you an example of how this can go wrong, very, very wrong. And quite sadly, after 30 years, um, that's his memory of working with Dorset Dor Dor County Council. Interestingly, and this is quite common, probably about 40 plus, there was no diagnosis before it's pointed out or before he knew he, he suspected there may be a problem. So for those of us who are sort of 40 plus, it's unlikely probably we would have a diagnosis from our school days because back then it wasn't really dealt with appropriately because the, perhaps the science wasn't there as well known but it wasn't really applied properly fast forward 10 20 30 years we're in a completely different state as i've said okay why isn't that working it is okay i want to i want to show you some reasonable adjustments i want you to think about these i just want to show you in particular one to seven here have a listen to this clarify the expectations of the job provide clear succinct instructions give structured training and monitoring Ensure the work environment is well structured, regular real review performance, provide sensitive direct feedback, provide reassurance and structured situations. Now, I don't know about you, but that's an ideal workplace. I'm not entirely sure why the county council needed advice on how to have that for someone with autism, because I think actually someone without autism deserves that. I would like that as well if I was working there. OK, so sometimes these cases really draw out some some nonsensical thinking where I think you really need to be told that's what you need in your teams. But have a look at that and then reflect yourself. How do I manage? What does my workplace look like? What would I do now if I was in a position of authority or management? How does that look like that? How, how can I make it so? Sensory distract distractions, that's typically things like smells. Some people might have a certain smell they want that can be soothing. Maybe it's something to touch um, that can help as well. And educating staff is really important as well, but you will need consent for that. Um, and often, unfortunately, people won't allow you to do that. 
Okay, I want to show you another horrendous case, and this is where um, I'm afraid this is the warning to you. So those of you who do manage, those of you who do employ or run businesses or are involved in businesses somewhere or another, um, this is where you could be named. I have a lot of sympathy for the lady, Deborah. Deborah Glancy was the manager here. I suspect she's a lovely lady. I suspect she's a fantastic manager and very dedicated. Unfortunately, it went completely pear-shaped for her. Npower, who's no longer, I think they were taken over, and they employed Mr. Sherborne. And employed him for five months. Um, and one of the calls Heidi and I get quite often, and for the uh, other HR people as well, is, well, they've been under two years, I can just get rid of them. We tend to say, crack on. Um, and then clearly we say, but I wouldn't if I were you for the following reasons. This is a case where well, you probably shouldn't do that. So Mr. Sherbourne was only 21. He started as an um, analytical analyst. I think quite what that is, was something um, very intellectual, far more intellectual than I do. Um, there was no autism diagnos diagnosis before employment from what I understand. But essentially what happened here is that he came into a workplace, probably a call center type environment where there was building work going on. He was in a, um, a walkway with lots of people here, people close to him. Now for autistic individuals, especially who are higher on the spectrum, that is an utter nightmare. And, and the video I'll show you later will show that. So he sought guidance and he displayed what was deemed to be capability issues and misconduct issues, but were actually his symptoms and the way his autism was exhibiting itself because he couldn't cope with the distractions. The lights might've been bright. So this gives you an insight in how his brain was wired that he couldn't help. The fact that people were talking noisily to him, the fact that there's building work going on behind him, the fact that people were walking back and forward blew his mind and he couldn't cope with it. He had a nervous breakdown. Um, and unfortunately, Mrs. Glancy does not come out well here, um, unfortunately, because she was untrained. And power did have um, some form of display about neurodiversity. Um, she didn't read it. HR did have a portal they could refer her to for education. They didn't. And instead, they gave her the capability procedure, which is effectively a way of saying we're going to manage you out. Uh, we think you have a capability issue due to something. It could be your performance. It could be your health. Um, he was dismissed because his contract came to an end, but he successfully claimed, got over £30,000. And the reason for that is because he'd been completely unfairly dismissed and he had been discriminated against. Um, I, I don't like doing this, but there's a scathing judgment from the employment tribunal. And this should rock us all to the core if we're employers or we're managers. This is how it can turn out for you. And if your early career, you've got sons, daughters, brothers, sisters who are managers, Perhaps slipped into conversation, I suppose, this real pessimistic doomsday guy the other day who said, if you're a manager, just remember your employer is no good to you when you're in the former tribunal being named as well. Okay, so unfortunately um, for Mrs. Glancy, the tribunal said this, you don't have to read it, but let me tell you, there was a continuous management failure. I remember how big N Power was, multi-million pounds, um, to understand Mr. Sherborne's disability, failing to implement two adjustments, there's only two required, that they could have done and they paid for for the advice and they didn't do it. They mixed up welfare and capability procedures. Quite why, I don't know, I keep reading it, I don't understand. They applied a PCP, now that's a technical term for saying they applied a policy effectively by saying, we're going to impose this capability procedure on you or we're threatening to because of your autism effectively, because of the way your autism exhibits itself. And that was indirectly discriminatory because that's bound to have more impact upon someone with autism, a disability, than it would someone who does not. Okay. Now, Mrs. Glancy, unfortunately, I don't know her age, I don't know what stage her career is in, but you can see now, unless she changes her name, you can see now why this can be so scary and why it's so serious. It's great that the government decided to make employment tribunal judgments public. There have always been public hearings, but you can see now why it's so serious. Because if you're in a criminal case, if you're caught speeding, you might be published by the local rag no one reads. But something you might innocently do or something your employer makes you do, you can still be named. So do keep that in mind. That's how serious this is. And that's why training is so important for managers. Um, legal concepts, what are the lessons from these two cases? Well, look, be alive to the causes of conflict. Conflict is not always because you've got someone who is difficult, quote unquote. My favorite phrase and the one I recommend is what's the motivation for the behavior? What's going on? People come and say to me, I've got this difficult person to rob and sort them out. And they say, well, okay, they might be difficult. Why are they difficult? They're just difficult. Well, let's explore, okay? It's not fluffy, it's legal, because you need to understand and, understand and appreciate that they maybe have a, um, some form of issue, something going on that you need to explore. Be ready to refer to occupational health. Train your managers on picking these. Engage with your people. Be ready to engage and talk to them, understand them. The best managers really know their teams. And I give an analogy like a dog. 
everyone or child when you haven't got a dog but everyone knows the child cry everyone knows the dog cry that's how well you should know your managers so you can say he or she is different today something's something's not right with them in the past week i think you should know your teams well enough to know something's up they shouldn't have to come to you and tell you there's a problem because often you'll be able to spot it before um policies are hammers those are like hammers they are hammers and like mrs glancy unfortunately if you go banning them around and throwing them around without knowing what you're doing you're going to hurt somebody and you're going to probably going to hurt your career as well um and the gordon ramsay quote there I don't, the kitchens always amaze me that the way people are treated in the kitchen but it's a culture and so when we look at culture one of the things is that policies don't often match the culture we have a lovely policy it's anti-harassment anti-bullying we love everybody we cuddle each other in the morning we don't discriminate but we treat people like utter trash and that happens frequently um so policies are hammers use them properly you won't go around checking a hammer around unless you know how to use it um be careful what i want to do so i want to skip ahead and make sure we have time for this video so bear me one second i want to move on to bear with me here we go I want to just turn to recruitment for a second because this is actually an underplayed issue in neurodiversity. People and employers are generally very good at knowing what they can and can't do during employment. Um, but I want to challenge some of you now um, to think differently about recruitment to those you advise, those you work with and for, or maybe suggest to your employers now. Um, recruitment is something that can really impact upon someone with neurodiversity really, really big in a big way, in, in so far as they won't even apply for the job, they think they, they will struggle with it. So I want to give you a, an example. I remember many, many years ago, I haven't had to apply for a job for a while but when I did many years ago it was a big organization and I got an interview and I remember the interview back coming through and there was a little bit about the people I'd been meeting and the name and there was this massive bit about where I'd park and I couldn't understand why I mean when I got there I understood it was a complicated car park but it was paragraphs and paragraphs and maps about where I'd park which was fascinating but I think I got the train anyway so it didn't make any difference so somebody or some group of people decided we must tell people where they're going to park it's really important to show them where they park scrap it people are intelligent these days we've got google view we've got google maps they can find their own way i challenge people and i'd like to see who's going to be there put a picture of them on there because the picture's probably going to be on the website somewhere so why not make it a bit further and say when you arrive heidi jim fred is going to meet you this is what they look like why are they going to be there because they're going to show you where the room is this is their job or they're going to be interviewing you or they're going to be taking notes What's expected? Give an agenda, tell them what tasks there will be. I've even heard it said that some employers will set the questions and send them out ahead. Give a map, but maybe the map needs to be about what happens when you get into the building. Because you've got to think about what that person's going to feel like when they get in, if they've got a neurodiversity issue, how they're going to feel. Tell them how it's going to be. Pictures, maps, colors. Think about it differently. The work environment, I challenge you to say, is it suitable? Is it suitable for you who maybe not have any neurodiversity issues? Is it suitable for someone like Mr. Sherborne who's going to really struggle with noise and building and being close? OK, you're only going to know that by asking. And that comes back to our health questions, which you need to be very careful on. Um, train your managers. Do engage with it, whether you have one person, whether you have 50 people, it doesn't matter. There's a myriad of training opportunities out there. We will help you. Other people will help you. But do engage in it, even if it's just online. Make the effort and take it seriously. Support your diverse employees be genuine with them talk to them welcome them um, watch working from home and returning from home those of you who are uh, perhaps responsible for contributing to um, that um, process or maybe involved in strategy remember people with autism especially have got a routine they're probably very happy they're not engaging with people and if you start saying from monday you're coming back in and that's the canteen that's the toilet you could really increase their anxiety so just think of it differently I'm not going to cover work-related stress because I do want to finish by showing you this video. This video um, is best played loud with your headphones on. Um, and it was made by the BBC. I can't make any claim to it. It was given to me many years ago when I watched a neurodiversity um, talk. I'm just trying to find it. Um, please do stay and listen to it. Please do watch it. And if you can, Google it and have it and, and share it, um, especially for managers. Um, I'm going to finish there, Heidi, because I think hopefully that's enough. It's an absolute whistle stop tour. This, this subject is massive, and I'd be more than happy to, to discuss in more detail. But um, I just want to share this with you. It's, it's about four minutes. I might close it down um, earlier, but it gives you an idea if you've got headphones and really listen um, what somebody, especially with autism, is going to feel like um, in certain situations. So, bear me one second. This should work. It has been working. We might get an ad because it's YouTube, but we'll try and ignore that.
Can anybody see, everyone see that here? No, we haven't got it yet. One second. I've got to share a different screen. Thank you so much, Robin. It's such an interesting topic to um, to take us through. So we really appreciate. No problem at all. I'm just going to share a different screen, and then I think I'll just leave it with you, and then I might just close it down once you've got the gist of it. Um, now, how do I do this? Is it going to work? No, oh, no, I lost it completely. So what, what I think I'll do is probably share it instead. Um, because actually yeah, if you put it in this the isn't chat, working. Put yeah, the yeah, that's in fine. The chat, that's a good I'll idea. Do that. But please do watch it and do it loud with headphones on. That's how you're gonna get the experience. But it really is a wake-up call. It made me really, really think um about what some people do go through just getting into an office each day. Um, I hope it's been helpful. If you've got any questions, disagreements, um, whatever it may be, please do share them. Um, and if you want to talk about the topic any further, just let me know. Um, I could talk about it all day. Um, but please do take it seriously. I know you will. Please do share the topic um, and then just start thinking differently because we all do.